So I hope you got through some of the material. Um, and I, I certainly hope that you got to see some things that you have, some texts that you hadn't seen before. A few of these texts in particular, I think, are real keepers. And uh, we'll spend a few minutes on those. Um, but just to reiterate, <coughs> Just to reiterate the opening comments, and I, I really wanted to make sure, and I know some people were, were stuck either with the language of uh, horizontal or vertical or being and becoming. I want to give permission that you can choose any of those um, dialectics that you like. If you, if for those of you who are longtime occupants of this Beit Midrash who want to just go back to Genesis and Exodus, that's OK, too. <laughs> Um, I personally, part of the reason that I am compelled by the horizontal vertical metaphor, even though a few of you said to me that you didn't like it, which is fine. Uh, remember, it's like pluralism, it's okay. Um, uh, part of the reason I feel compelled by it is because I like the image of imagining peoplehood sitting at the center of the axis of the horizontal and vertical and thinking about not just um, the Judaism of being and becoming, but the ways in which these stories obligate us. So the ways in which we feel obligated to other Jews based on horizontal identity is an obligation that originates just from the fact that there are other Jews living at the same time as us, whereas being obligated to other Jews based on a vertical identity is being obligated to those Jews who share our sense of mission and purpose, those Jews to whom we see a real relationship of our own Judaism. In some ways, the difference between an obligation um, to Jews who share our Judaism versus to, Jew, to the Jewish people, regardless of whether they share our version of Judaism or not, really obligates us in very different directions. So I wanted to signal at the outset um, the, the, the significance of these, both of these voices existing as profound and loud voices in our tradition and coexisting simultaneously. At the same time, I want to acknowledge that the historical and political conditions in which the Jewish people find themselves for much of our history does not necessarily require the Jewish people to have to choose between the horizontal identity and the vertical identity, <laughs> between being and becoming. Because by, by most historical political circumstances prior to emancipation and enlightenment, we are essentially coerced into a group identity by external forces. Right? The strongest vehicle for, um, for peoplehood by default is other people who will not let you be part of their people. <laughs> so if by necessity you are forced into a group identity by others, the urgency of actually having to articulate what are the core components of a peoplehood, defining, having to define your identity is obviously made much more uh, pressing by the, the, the right of Jews to define their identity on their own. I want to signal, before we jump into the texts, what I mean by um, enlightenment, em enlightenment and emancipation challenging the story. And not just in the trivial sense of challenging and rupturing much of what we know to be true in pre-modern Jewish history, but really forcing us um, very differently to confront what we mean by Jewish peoplehood. The enlightenment problem, which again I'll call a problem, but it's actually a good thing. Um, um, the, the challenge of enlightenment is that Judaism um, begins to have to define itself um, and evaluate its own credibility within the context of a marketplace of ideas. This is a central challenge of enlightenment that no longer is Jewishness as an identity take for grantable by its adherence, but rather through the encounter with the philosophical tradition has to define itself qualitatively relative to the existence of other ideas. The good news is that, at least from my perspective, Judaism gets better as a result of that encounter. <laughs> right? If you're actually challenged by the best of moral thinking, not just that exists within the context or the confines of your own community, but that the, the Enlightenment challenge requires Judaism to articulate itself in a, in a credible language to the best of the philosophical tradition outside of your community, forces Judaism to articulate itself in better ways than it ever does before. The challenge that it creates, however, is number one, I'll say there's two challenges. Number one, the Enlightenment invites a diversity of responses of articulating what Judaism means that by, by definition are gonna start competing with and challenging one another. Right, so part of what you look, what, part of what happens with the emergence of denominationalism is the attempts by various different traditions to define Judaism in relationship to the Enlightenment and by necessity 
starting to compete as authentic definitions of Judaism with one another in much more public and explicit ways. The second big challenge that Enlightenment creates is that the argument that one belongs to the Jewish people just by accident or by default becomes uncompelling. Um, its inability to, to articulate a reason for Jewishness that relates to the big philosophical and moral questions that the rest of the world is asking become, makes the whole notion of Judaism as belonging to a community alone morally and politically uncompelling. The emancipation challenge, which again, we have to frame within the context of being basically good news, right? Better to be emancipated than not. Um, the emancipation challenge, um, again, creates two, um, at least two challenges. One is that it makes Jews welcome in the societies that they're in, and the result reduces the urgency, um, reduces the urgency of having to articulate my identity as belonging to the group of people that are just Jews or put, more, put, put a little differently, it essentially requires oftentimes an explicit trade. I'm trading my, I, my groupness of my Jewishness for a French identity. This is explicit in the Napoleonic Sanhedrin. We didn't study it here, but it's one of the many texts we could have been studying. Um, an explicit trade of if you want to be full citizens of the project that is Frenchness, you have to be willing to forego and forfeit some of that project of belonging that you have characterized as Jewishness. In other words, it's not just that belonging to a group is perhaps a little less compelling, it's that I'm being, off, being offered a different type of belonging. <laughs> and it, one, the minute that I choose into a different type of belonging, by necessity, the, the idea that I would define my Jewishness purely through the horizontal, purely through the notion of belonging, no longer becomes possible. But the other challenge that it creates is that it moves our loyalties by definition to other people. Um, my loyalty is now not necessarily anymore just to Jews who happen to be Jewish. It is now also to French people who happen to be French. And, uh, and, and although this is not as trivial, as trivial as it will ultimately become in all, in all of our Jewish educational upbringings, of if Israel and America went to war, which side would you be on? That's the trivialization of this question. In practice, it does actually manifest into a question of, am I, if I talk about myself, my sense of, be, of belonging to the Jewish people, but I see myself as inherently belonging to another society, even without those things being tested, there is a certain, um, there's a certain uh, uh, limited commodity of loyalty that I might have to people who I classify as my fellow travelers. And although it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to choose between these and those, in practice, we do choose between these and those. We, and, and, I, and I oftentimes, um, I'm skipping ahead a little bit here, but I oftentimes ask Jews who will define themselves as being real peoplehood Jews, by which they mean real being Jews, real Genesis Jews, who talk about themselves as being essentially Jewish because they connect to other people. I oftentimes ask them whether they actually would pass the B'nai B'rach test. I, in theory, you say that you're committed to the Jewish people. <laughs> but if I can identify somebody in B'nai B'rach who doesn't share your politics, your theology, may not think that you are Jewish enough to be X, would you lay your life on the line for that person more than you might for your non-Jewish neighbor in the community where you live? And if you can't really pass the B'nai B'rach test, it means that the challenge of emancipation has actually tested by giving us contexts of profound belonging whether the Judaism of being can effectively compete um, as, as, a, as a thick and robust um, identity. On the other side, what, the emancip what emancipation also does is it moves our loyalty from being to other Jews to our loyalty being to Judaism. Now that I'm a comfortable French person or American or whatever else, I still want to retain some sense of loyalty to the Jewish people but instead of it simply being to people who happen to be Jewish, because remember, again, political loyalty has been dislodged to other people who are American, I'm going to be loyal to those who share my notion of what Judaism is. And my language around Judaism is going to be about aspirations and morals. In order for me to, if I don't have to survive, if I don't have to hold on to my Jewishness in order to physically survive, I might locate my Jewishness as a tool of spiritual survival.
And that these two moves, emancipation and enlightenment, really underlie um, the first set of sources that I asked you to look at. Um, I asked you to look first at the Pittsburgh platform and, and the Khatam Sofa, which um, are, ob are texts that are obviously and patently in dialogue with one another, even if, as is often the case, they are unacknowledging of one another. But the reason I put them in dialogue with one another is because they both couldn't exist without the political circumstances that created one another. <laughs> the same political social circumstances of emancipation and enlightenment invite these two types of becoming responses, these two types of horizontal responses. In the context of the reform movement, um, I'm sorry? Vertical. Vertical, thank you. Oh, you're paying attention, that's good. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, the two types of vertical responses. In the context of the reform movement, famously in the Pittsburgh platform, we recognize the Mosaic legislation, a system of training the Jewish people for its mission dur during its national life in Palestine, to, for which that was the past. And today we accept as binding only its moral laws. Right? So the extent to which this matters is not that it actually does something to create or to consolidate group identity as though that is a value in and of itself, but only the extent to which it actually holds us up to the best of the moral tradition in the societies that we're living. Um, as you see near the end of the section that's here, we recognize in the modern era of universal culture of heart and intellect, the approaching of the realization of Israel's great messianic hope for the establishment of a kingdom of truth, justice, and peace among all men. This is very suggestive, the language of messianism as it's used by the reform movement, but it has no bearing to the messianism of political nationalism that comes to characterize Zionism not a century later, but rather we consider ourselves no longer a nation, a kind of a breathtaking statement, but a religious community and expect therefore neither a return to Palestine nor sacrificial worship, sacrificial worship under the sons of Aaron, okay, I'm with you on that second clause, <laughs> nor the restoration of any of the laws concerning the Jewish state. Don't bother me with the collectivity for the purposes of political reorganization. Don't bother me with the messianic return to the coherence of a Judaism of being. We are entirely um, a community that is constituted by the people of becoming. The, uh, of the people of becoming. That is what we're committed to. And to the extent that our tradition speaks in the context of, un of a universal moral language, hold on to that phrase because we'll come back to it, to the extent that our tradition speaks within the context of a universal moral language, I want to be a part of it. But the messy stuff of actual political organizing around group identity, that is not about organizing around moral identity, but about political identity, the reform movement in the late 19th century has no interest in it. And in some ways, I want to, I'll step out of the ledge for a second, I think psychologically, the tshuva for this statement still characterizes some of contemporary modern reform discourse. I, I want to suggest there's been so many steps in the reform movement in the past hundred years of walking back the Pittsburgh platform that it's still somehow lingering there of at the time when this was on the rise for the Jewish people as a transformation of Jewish identity, we didn't want it. And therefore, what do we have to do now to correct for that moment um, that once existed? The parallel version to that story is in the Khatam Sofer, and I think these have to be understood as in relationship to one another. I gave you some of the greatest hits of the Khatam Sofer. Um, the, most famous, um, the most famous line with which the Khatam Sofer, one of the kind of intellectual architects of what is now known as ultra-Orthodoxy, even with all of its manifestations, it's not one denomination or one movement, it's more like a, a loose system of ideas that now characterizes a significant percentage of the Jewish people. The most famous is the one near the end of the phrase of Chadash Asur Min HaTorah, um, things that are new are forbidden. I actually just want to read the first section um, because this is, as, this, is an this is a more explicit response to the culture of reform. How is it that words which emanated from the mouths of the knowledgeable and wise, whose understanding is as wide as the opening of the universe and which were sifted and refined again over hundreds of years by thousands of rabbis and became permanent fixtures amongst the people for close to 2,000 years, with no one even contemplating and raising a word or, uh, or moving a finger in objection, there then rise these little foxes, the darkness of exile, to breach the wall of the rabbis and destroy their fence and alter the form of their prayers and blessings. Right? How is it possible that this worked for a long time and then these people come along and damage and alter it? This is a very learned passage. Even the language of breaching, breaching the fence, 
right, which has both a halachic connotation, because the things that are objectionable according to halacha are not just that which is protected by the fence, but ultimately the fence itself. The fence takes on religious significance. We don't, right, um, you don't ride a horse on Shabbat, not because you actually can't ride a horse on Shabbat, but because you might break a branch off of a tree and hit the horse, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm preventing the breaking of a branch of a tree by prohibiting something else entirely. So I'm conscious of that fenceness. But implied here also is not just a religious issue, but a political issue. The breaching of the walls and the crossing of the fence is both the, trans, the, the transgression against Jewish law, but it's also a transgression against Jewish destiny. That language of wall and fence was used by diaspora Jews based on the Talmud for hundreds of years to imagine that we only cross that threshold from diaspora back into homeland when we are given messianic permission to actually do so. Right, so here, the Chatam Sofer's resistance to the language of change, the consequence of this language of change is the erecting of a notion that the Judaism that he is living is not in dialogue with but is directly and existentially challenged by the Judaism of becoming that's being created in reform. It's hard to underestimate the ways in which denominationalism is such a massive shift away from, from the notion of peoplehood that imagines that we are essentially working with the same raw materials and our obligations are essentially to one another, but you eat this on Shabbos and I eat this on Shabbos. The construction of the significance of these ideological walls as different articulations of what true Torah, true Judaism is, as explicit and as pronounced as it is in the Pittsburgh platform as it is in the Chatam Sofer, implied in that is that the political community of what it means to be part of the Jewish people are those who support my, my particular vision of what Judaism is. This is an explicit response to both these challenges of enlightenment emancipation. The, the, the corresponding move, however, the early 20th century move, the resistance to this proliferation of um, verticalism, this proliferation of the denominational, um, con happens in the context of the rise of anti-Semitism and Zionism as the particular, um, one of the particular political tools or manifestations of the story, which creates a different urgency for us and a different urgency for now. <laughs> That's all nice and well and good, that you are building your own spiritual community and your spiritual Judaism, but emancipation ain't what it cracked up to be. <laughs> That's, that didn't sound right. Ain't what it was supposed to be, whatever it is. You had a vision that you were gonna actually be members of the societies that you were in, but it turns out that was actually a myth. And what, what emerges as a response, what 1917 I think represents, is um, the horizontal strikes back. What the Jewish people need now is not clear micro-articulation of what Judaism is supposed to be, but concrete political solutions that enable the us of Jewish peoplehood, the Judaism of being, to find its, to find its articulation in concrete political programs that enable the survival of the actual Jewish people. The best expression of this, I think, I didn't give you as a text, is from Leo Strauss, um, who writes you know, 50 years on, he summarizes um, he summarizes the horizontal pushback to the vertical in the most cynical and breathtaking way possible in his, um, in his uh, piece, in his book on Spinoza, where he says, what is the Baal Tshuva? Strauss asks, what is a Baal Tshuva? He says, to me, a Baal Tshuva is this. A Baal Tshuva is the Jew who goes out to the world in pursuit of um, universal moral community. See, he's channeling the Pittsburgh platform. And he goes out and discovers that he's the only one. The Jews had this myth of universal moral community that characterized a lot of the late 19th century. Remember Esperanto? Esperanto was all Jews, <laughs> right? We're gonna actually build this magnificent moral universalistic community and those are the people to whom we're loyal. And Strauss says, the Jew goes out thinking that's what he's gonna do and discovers he's the only one. And when that person retreats back into his community and rejoin his community, that's a Baal Tshuva. <laughs> it's cynical, but it reflects this, this story in a, in a very poetic way, which is to say, vertical community, the longing for the aspirational of the moral, to make Judaism about um, a language of seeking, the, a language of understanding, and jettisoning that notion of loyalty to the Jewish people just because the Jewish people are your people, 
let jettisoning the notion that this people should be reduced to one homeland as opposed to being citizens of the world is an authentic response to the politics of the 20th century. You Jews wanted to be, you know, and you look back, Napoleon, the, the Napoleonic moment, we look back at as what great naivete <laughs> that Jews actually thought that they could be European. Right? I find this happens, continues to happen generationally now in America. One of the things I speak out about more than anything else is about the opportunities that American Jews have in the present moment through, due to our affluence and influence and power and privilege to actually articulate a powerful meaning for Judaism in America, right, and to take responsibility for this story. We have, we have surpassed in many ways um, in America many of the existential threats that American Jews might have faced earlier. And the first inevitable response that I get anywhere I speak about this, um, except when I speak to younger people, the first inevitable response is, didn't German Jews say that in 1920s? Didn't they think that the story of a Judaism of being was essentially over? And, it, and I, my cynical side says, you're just doing that to resist the responsibilities that you have. If you get back to the story of our main job is to prevent anti-Semitism and persecution, you're, you're, you're alleviating the, 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 the responsibilities that come with privilege. But what it also reflects psychologically is, no, 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 this story your story of the aspirational Judaism of becoming misunderstands that a big piece of what we have had to deal with as a Jewish people is that Judaism of becoming, it's not alone. <laughs> There's another story of Jewish life which is the pursuit of the aspirations of simply the story of our national people that requires the safety and security of a national home. This one paragraph in the middle of the Balfour Declaration in 1917, one of the most momentous paragraphs in Jewish history, which, as you saw, gets translated almost verbatim into the League of Nations mandate for Palestine. You notice that? <laughs> like, as from a text perspective, it's, it's, it's breathtaking. This one letter that's written um, by, by, um, by Balfour, His Majesty's government, views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate that achievement. And here, this wonderful subordinate clause, because they know the fear that this is going to awaken in the Jews of becoming who are still trying to become in the civilizations that they're in. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political statuses enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Don't worry, simply because we are dignifying, this is not what Balfour is thinking, but this is what we think, just because we are dignifying the return of the Judaism of being doesn't mean we are eliminating the Jews of becoming. <laughs> Don't think that by giving Jews the rights to a national homeland, we are taking away from them the rights that they have justly earned as citizens of the societies that they're in. And, and as we read it, we know like how naive. <laughs> At the same time, Louis Brandeis is writing this, an apologetic about his Zionism, conscious of this exact issue saying, no, no, you can be a Zionist and a good American because these are not at odds with each other. And the reason he's writing it is because as Zionism rises, as the rest of the world sees that Jews want to be a people of being again, the permission that they will be granted to be a people of becoming, to be the citizens of the places that they're in in pursuit of their own spiritual and moral destiny, as opposed to simply their corporate political identity, is being profoundly jeopardized by this political moment. And finally, as you see, um, that in that tension between the horizontal and the vertical, it takes less than 50 years for the Columbus platform to walk back the severity of the Pittsburgh platform. And the date on this is staggering, 1937. Like, oh, wait. <laughs> it turns out that the idea of having abandoned the notion of particular community, of group identity that exists simply because Jews are thought to be in relationship to other Jews as some sort of empirical ontological phenomenon. That is, we thought that was done in 1885, and lo and behold, by 1937, we realized that we're wrong. And it's, it's really breathtaking to read these texts together. Though we recognize in the group loyalty of Jews who have become estranged from our religious tradition a bond which still unites them with us, we maintain that it is by religion and for its religion that the Jewish people have lived. So this is stage one, right? It's still about religion. It's not about peoplehood, 
but we now are willing to at least hedge that a little bit. <laughs> you see the walking back that's taking place here? We might have stepped too far out on the ledge in insisting that this was entirely a religious tradition as opposed to being a peoplehood tradition, but we're still making the case for religion in 1937, right? Um, you see at the end, we affirm the obligation of all Jewry to aid in its upbuilding as a Jewish homeland by endeavoring to make it not only a, a haven of refuge for the oppressed and so on and so forth. This, even at the end, our messianic goal is still the pursuit of the moral, which I've characterized as the vertical or the becoming. But I've now at least made the concession that the story of becoming, the story of the horizontal, also matters. So it, 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 on one hand, you get the revenge of the horizontal as articulated clearly in the rise of political Zionism, the way that political Zionism crushes and defeats all of its competitors within the context of this place as the instrument that ultimately defines the society. All of the utopian Zionism winds up fading away. The, that Zionism that may in and of itself had been a Zionism of becoming, all of that loses. The reform movement moves a little bit towards it, <laughs> acknowledging that it's losing its ideas, not being totally willing to get to where the Pittsburgh platform gets the 1980s, <laughs> which looks like it could have been written by any Zionist in history. Um, but you, you, can see, you can feel the way in which these, these two threads are pushing and pulling against one another. But I want to read, um, this is to me the most fun part, um, which is of these resistance. Four voices, um, <coughs> Montague, Rosenzweig, Arendt, and Deutscher, right? Um, four people who would have never found themselves in the same room at the same time, but find themselves conveniently here on the source sheet together. Um, four resistances that signal in their hostility to this agenda an awareness of how dramatically the, the pendulum has swung in the other direction. Both Rosenzweig and Arendt feel to me that these are texts that could have been written in 2017 by American Jews. Right? This deep awareness of, you thought this was going to solve the problem. You think that that Judaism of being, that Judaism of a horizontal loyalty <coughs> to the Jewish people for its own sake solves all the problems of the Jewish people? That solves maybe a particular political problem, but it does not solve the massive Jewish problem of what does it mean to be Jewish. You, saw in, you see in Montague, Montague's resistance is exactly what um, Balfour feared, which is one resistance by diaspora Jews is, you can go build your settlement there if you want, but don't claim that your settlement in Palestine is the total seizure of the language of what it means to be Jewish, right? You're doing a micro peoplehood project, but actually you're jeopardizing your right to actually benefit from the fruits of emancipation and be a, a, a citizen here um, in England. My favorite part of that whole text is what does he imagine as the thing that Jews are going to look on? The Mount of Olives. He doesn't even know what he's talking about. What Jew, in what Jew as a Zionist would have been longing for the Mount of Olives? Right? He kind of, what's that? Dead Jews, right. He, get, like, he gives himself away here. Right? He's so cynical and so skeptical of this that he betrays in his criticism um, his inability to relate to what's actually going on. Rosenzweig I found to be breathtaking. Rosenzweig, on Rosenzweig's argument is, is he says what, what is, what he says what has held us together since emancipation was emancipation itself. Our whole political goal was actually to be free of the bonds that held us together. The only thing we were longing for was to get past the shackles that were holding us together. And now that we're actually free and we can do what we want, we have no plausible answer. We have no discourse of meaning that explains what Judaism is supposed to be about. This breathtaking line, Zionism, diagnostician of genius, but most mediocre healer. Recognize the disease, but prescribe the wrong treatment. What it recognized was that we were, we, we knew post-emancipation and post-enlightenment that Judaism was about, was supposed to be about something bigger, something magnificent, something that would answer the big existential questions that Jews were asking about what their purpose was supposed to be in the world. Zionism recognized that emancipation um, was a problem and therefore provided this answer would be a defense against anti-Semitism. But as he says, what Zionism also recognized, and here proved itself to be a pathologist, not merely a diagnostician, is that um, 
What, what, what it does is it proves to us that we can actually live and thrive. We can create a Judaism of, of being in homeland, but it doesn't actually answer the questions of identity and meaning that have, meant to, that have been meaning to animate us all along. Rosenzweig loses. <laughs> Right? By, by appearing as he does in the early 1920s, this idea competing with Balfour, it can't compete. Balfour has recognized as a result of the anti-Semitic transformations that the Jewish people need homeland. The insistence in that moment that the Jewish people don't just need homeland but me need meaning comes across as trivialities. It comes across as a frivolity. Meaning is the stuff that you do when you have leisure time. Surviving is the stuff that you have to do when the urgency is that of survival. My favorite lit text in the whole list is here from Hannah Arendt. Um, Arendt is writing in response um, to Gershom Shalom. Uh, in response to the, um, as you recall, <coughs> Arendt had been sent by the New Yorker to serially cover the Eichmann trial here in Israel and sent back serial, serialized pieces in the New Yorker, which ultimately she collects into the title of the book, um, uh, Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. I've talked about it here in this Beit Midrash before. Arendt gets in trouble um, for two different reasons um, related to this book. One is the title. The language, a report on the banality of evil, gets misinterpreted by her critics to mean that she thinks that the Nazis weren't so bad. The deep misunderstanding of what the banality of evil was supposed to be. What she actually was trying to argue for was how quickly and possibly any society can deteriorate to become what the Nazis were. When we imagine the Nazis as being exceptional and theological, it absolves us of the responsibility from preventing totalitarianism to take place in any of our societies. So she gets into problem number one because of that, and problem number two that, sh that she gets herself into trouble with is because she um, she ramps up the degree of, um, of culpability, and she places a lot of it on the Jewish leaders in Europe. It says the Jewish leaders were responsible more than the traditional canonical narratives of the Holocaust like to tell that story. Parenthetically, the main reason she gets in trouble is because she is a political dissident in the Jewish community on Israel-Palestine. And therefore, her whole theology gets packaged in to a, a larger context of being someone who is thought of as a political dissident. But it's very telling. In 2017, Hannah Arendt would be mainstream in the American Jewish community. <laughs> in the 19, what's that? She kind of is. Her ideas are alive and well. In the time where she writes, she, is com she has completely lost to this Straussian, Balfourian turn in the 20th century of the privileging of the horizontal and the rejecting of the vertical. And so the, 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 the paragraph she says here, this incredible response to Gershom Shalom, is a losing argument in the middle of the 20th century, but it's a rising argument in the beginning of the 21st, where she says, to come to the point, let me begin going on from what I've just stated with what you call love of the Jewish people, or Ahava Israel. I, have, um, I share with Arendt a deep resentment of this phrase, loving the Jewish people mostly because it is usually used as a blunt instrument by some people against others of you don't love the Jewish people enough. And at a certain point, I start to wonder, if peoplehood is a cudgel that you use as a, use as a blunt instrument against other Jewish people, you might be misusing the term. <laughs> so Arendt says, okay, you say, Shalom had written to Arendt and said, don't you love the Jewish people? How could you write such a book? And she says, okay, first of all, I would be grateful if you could tell me when this concept has played a role in Judaism, when it was first used in Hebrew language and literature, et cetera. That sounds like a genuine request, but I think she's being a little bit cynical. Like, you're making that up. That's not a thing, Ava Israel, love of the Jewish people. But then she says instead, you are quite right. I'm not moved of any love of this sort, and for two reasons, I have never in my life loved any people or collective, neither the German people, which she obviously uses as the first to prove her point, the minute that society has become obsessed with love of their own people, look what happens to them. That was the whole purpose of the book of Eichmann in Jerusalem. Nor the French, nor the American, nor the working class or anything of that sort. You can hear, as you do this as a text study, she's like, no, 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 don't think I'm a Marxist in the sense that I don't love this nationality, but I love the working class. Now, any of your accusations that you have against me, I'm gonna resist in that one sentence. Instead, I indeed only love my friends, and the only kind of love I know and believe in is the love of persons. 
Second, this love of the Jews um, would appear to me, since I am myself Jewish, as something rather suspect. I cannot love myself or anything which I know is part and parcel of my own person. Not convinced of that online, but okay. To clarify this, let me tell you of a conversation I had in Israel with Golda Meir, as you saw in the footnote, um, which she, who she refers to as a he in the remaining paragraph, obviously because if you should describe the prominent political personality in Israel in reference to a she in 1960 or whatever she was writing, I would be like, oh yeah, that's Golda Meir. Um, <laughs> who was defending the, in my opinion, disastrous non-separation of religion and state in Israel. What he said, I am not sure of the exact words anymore, ran something like this. You understand that as a socialist, I, of course, do not believe in God. I believe in the Jewish people. I found this a shocking statement and being too shocked, I did not reply at the time. And then she does the thing that all of us want to do, which is when you think about the comeback, you then publish it later. <laughs> um, right? um, I was at the idiot store and they ran out of you. Anyone? Yes? Thank you. Um, um, that wasn't meant to you. That's a Seinfeld quote. People, do people know that? It's a Seinfeld quote? Yes? OK, good. I was, I was like, half the people are laughing because they know it's a Seinfeld quote, and half the people are insulted. Um, no, no. It wasn't about you. Um, OK, I found this a shocking statement. Of being too shocked, I didn't reply at the time. But I could have answered, the greatness of this people was once that it believed in God and believed in him in such a way that its trust and love towards him was greater than its fear. And now this people believes only in itself. What good can come of that? That is an astonishingly true statement. Right? What Arendt is seeing is that this Judaism of being has become totalitarian. The obsession with Judaism as simply about a horizontal identity, love of the Jewish people for its own sake, you hear her anxious about what that will do to a society that is convinced in merely the love of its own people and not the belief in some transcendental purpose of what that people was supposed to do in the world. Right? That's what, wait a second, I thought we were Jews the way that the Rambam told us we were Jews, which was we all faced in one direction and we were praying towards a common purpose. And then, once I understand that everybody is praying towards a common purpose, anyone who's praying towards that common purpose is part of my people. And that allows you to bring in all sorts of people who weren't originally part of your people, and you kick out the people who are facing in the other direction. But that's what we're about. And now what you're telling me is that Jewish peoplehood is essentially a narcissistic exercise of Jewish self-love, which validates which, in, which licenses anything that the Jewish people will do, my response is, yes, I am a loyal soldier to that project. What, what is what you're doing with love of the Jewish people? In what ways is that different than the fanatical forms of nationalism that have overtaken Europe in the middle of the 20th century? What's that about? Now, you can see why writing things like this doesn't buy Hannah Arendt a lot of friends in the 1950s and 1960s. But what I want you to listen for is that this represents Again, if being and becoming are twin poles of this Jewish peoplehood story, the ways in which they are being wrenched from one direction to another invites more and more vociferous responses. And to me, I don't think you can understand the tone of Jewish politics in America and in Israel and, and the degree of hostility about what Jews are doing right and wrong with respect to attitudes towards Israel without hearing these as the antecedents to that moment. These represent this constant pushback between a Judaism of being, the Judaism of the horizontal, and the Judaism of becoming. I want to conclude um, in reference to the contemporary moment. Um, I gave to you um, the problem of American Jewish verticalism and the problem of, um, of what we'll call Israeli horizontalism. The American Jewish critique and the loudest critics to this effect have been Stephen Cohen and Jack Wertheimer. Um, and, and, and there's a, a larger industry around it, has been the insistence that American Jews, as a result, again, of our own American version of emancipation and enlightenment, 70 years on from the creation of the State of Israel, have by and large abandoned the horizontal peoplehood story in exchange for something else. Now, you can call this any version of a whole set of problems that you like, the abandonment of Israel, the distancing from Israel, the replacing of particular American Jewish um, identity causes, right? That's more important than projects that purport to speak to the Jewish people. Wertheimer plays this out, particularly when it comes to issues of philanthropy. Why do Jews give to social justice causes and, and not to what you might call particularist Jewish causes? Why do, we why do we seem to care more about 
um, taking care of them than taking care of us. This is a large scale critique that expresses most profoundly and most politically this, this um, frustration by Jews who are primarily of being with the failure of those who, are, who have become primarily of becoming. The American Jewish community more than others is the one diaspora community that drifted after Zionism most quickly back to the story of becoming. Most of the diasporas were transformed by the creation of the State of Israel. The degrees of aliyot were much higher in every other diaspora than in the American Jewish community. The American Jewish community, in a moment of urgency in the 1950s and 1960s, became characterized by the willingness to support the project of the Jewish national homeland and did so with enormous philanthropy and advocacy and lobbying and, and infrastructure building in the society simply because that's what the Jewish people needed at that time. And what we see today seems to be a kind of reverting back to the mean, <laughs> the drift back to a story of becoming, or at least a regression away from the notion that what it means to support Jewish peoplehood is primarily to support the peoplehood of being. Um, and it's not a surprise that as that happens in the American Jewish context, the anger and the vitriol that will come from those who have insisted that Judaism is primarily a story of being will increase, right? The intensity of that story will increase as this drift uh, begins to take place. I don't think Cohen and Wertheimer are wrong with this critique. I guess my critique to them is, well, how do we make sure that the response to what you don't like in Jewish life is still a yes and response, as opposed to once again bending back and insisting that Judaism is supposed to be a single narrative as opposed to these dual narratives? I think that's probably true for both of these thinkers. I think both for both of them, yes, we recognize that this is both a story of being and becoming, but somehow the anxiety that animates what you think is going wrong in Jewish life oftentimes forces you to be really loud in your critique and sound as though you are more one note than you are the other. The problem in Israeli society, and one that I, I know we're gonna spend more time on over the course of, um, of this week and beyond, is the ways in which if the American Jewish community has drifted perhaps at times dangerously towards a story of becoming, right? Um, that's why kind of the flagship book of that story is The Jew Within. It's about you as an individual, it's about you, about your, your autonomous pursuits, and not about us. The story of the state of Israel drifts oftentimes dangerously to becoming a caricature of what happens when a society is entirely about being and has abandoned the story of becoming. This is a, com this is a common critique, um, a story where Zionism becomes as, as though an end in of itself. You hear a rent ringing in your ear, love of the Jewish people for its own sake, loyalty to a state um, simply because it's the state of the Jewish people, the insistence that, you know, that Israel is the homeland of the Jewish people, but that not all Jewish people have equal stake in that homeland, suggests that I'm using that framework to invite loyalty more than I'm using that framework to invite participation. It's not that I want you diaspora Jews to shape the vision of what the state of Israel is supposed to be. It's a state of Israel that's not about becoming. It's that I want you diaspora Jews to show your loyalty to what this state actually is. The gap between a state that is aspirational versus a state that is characterizes the central problem um, of the state of Israel reckoning with this problem of being a Judaism of being. One of my colleagues, Shai Zarchi, who many of you know, um, said last, I heard him last year speaking uh, in at Kabbalat Shabbat in the port of Tel Aviv and said something really powerful about the renewal of Jewish spirituality in the state of Israel, which is a big story. It's manifest in places like the port of Tel Aviv on Friday night or the train station here in Jerusalem, but it's represented in actually much more subtle and nuanced ways by the ways in which Israelis are once again retreating to what Achad Ha'am prophesied as the problem, which is you create a state that doesn't answer what Judaism is supposed to be. And here Achad Ha'am and Rosenzweig are in relationship to one another. And here too Achad Ha'am is becoming a prophet of what it was that the state of Israel was supposed to facilitate, which was a Jewish cultural renewal awakening. It was a place in which being would enable becoming, even though actually sometimes being savages becoming. And the thing that Shai said um, at the Port of Tel Aviv, which I, I've been thinking about constantly, 
is he said, look, I don't give my ancestors a hard time about this. We came to a mountain, and in order to climb that mountain, we had to leave our baggage on the, gr uh, we had to leave our, our baggage at the foot of the mountain. And our baggage was all of the majestic stuff of Jewish life, all of our literature, and all of our culture, and all of our dreams. But we needed to climb a mountain. There was an urgent political necessity to climb to the top of that mountain, so we left our luggage at the bottom of the mountain. He said, and at a certain point, once you're actually secure on the mountain, you recognize that you left something behind and you lost it. And the project of spiritual renewal in Israel is about going back down the mountain, collecting all of that diasporic baggage that was actually pretty good for the Jewish people, our literature, our culture, our ideas, and our dreams, and bringing it back up the mountain to remind ourselves that the goal of this project wasn't merely to climb the mountain, but it was to build a city on a hill. I thought that was pretty good. Um, I hope he writes it somewhere so we could actually use it as a text. But he, the story he's telling is that sometimes the Jewish people have to live through a phase of being because those are the political urgencies that are demanded of us. I don't fault the state of Israel post Shoah and its early political challenges from having to essentially prioritize one story of Jewish peoplehood. I don't fault diaspora Jews for thinking that their primary responsibility through the building of the state of Israel was just to support the state of Israel as it was and not agitate the state of Israel to become something else. I get it. But when Shai signals, now there's a moment to remember that this wasn't simply about getting to the promised land, but it was actually building a model civilization in the promised land, that there's an opportunity for once again the bridging of the being and becoming <coughs> to become something that the state of Israel can be committed to. There is a danger. The danger that's inherent in that is that the becoming serves the being as opposed to balancing the being. Right? This is not merely, we don't want a Judaism in the state of Israel that is merely um, serves the objectives of Jewish survival. Sometimes what the Judaism that we want aspirationally has to challenge the ethics of Jewish survival. It has to be in dialogical relationship with it rather than merely serving its function. We also have a fear that, that becoming sometimes makes us denominationalists. <laughs> and when we become denominationalists, having a diaspora denominationalism in Israel in a Judaism of being is the worst of all worlds. <laughs> The missing piece for Israeli society is building a culture of becoming that serves the national project of the Jewish people rather than severing it or dividing it. In some ways, the bad version of what's possible here is what I called, what you call diaspora particular, diasporaic particularism, a competitive culture. The belief that um, when Jews do Jewish in Israel, it's in means that articulate radically different versions from each other and fight in places like public squares or coattails. The good version of this story would be, how does the state of Israel, how does the homeland of the Jewish people that resulted from an extraordinary century of a Judaism of being taking its rightful place in response to political urgencies, we get why this had to happen at this particular time in history to make possible the articulation of a story that the Jewish people desperately needed. Right? At a certain point, becoming became a luxury item and being became a necessity. But the challenge for the state of Israel today is to figure out the language of becoming that pr produces a Judaism here that, um, that fills a society that, um, that would be the fullest version for an actual state of the Jewish people rather than multiple shtetls in this place. Paul Becker has talked about this, David Hartman talked about it. We didn't come to this place in order to rebuild the largest shtetl in the world, much less we didn't come to this place in order to have multiple shtetls around it. The challenge of the Judaism of becoming in Israel, which is David, what David Ben-Gurion called Mamlachtiyut, what David Hartman was committed to more than anything else, was figuring out how to build a Judaism in this place that would truly make for the possibility of this place being a homeland for the Jewish people. Thank you. Yeah. Yehuda, um, I'm interested in, in understanding for you, are there two different kinds of being? 
one that is um, in the Deutsche piece, where Deutsche speaks about a Zionism that he is, is fully Vidyeved, he acknowledges his historical Zionism. Is there such a thing as Vidyeved being versus Lakatila being? Meaning that would someone say that, that just as you know, historical, historical necessity for Zionism requires a land, other exigencies require a certain relationship to DA that can be let go of uh, in, in context of safety that would be that someone would say, I, I acknowledge that there's being, but being almost always becomes something fanatical, and that becoming is more idyllic, and, and in that right. sense, diasporic, uh, you know, North American people would actually be an evolutionarily more progressive stance. And second, I want to ask you, um, you we have being versus becoming as potential or, or horizontal vertical, but in the last piece that you, your, your last, uh, your summation, which is beautiful, it feels as though things that were intention are actually hierarchically um, situated, and that becoming subsumes but doesn't negate being uh, in that way, so they're not actually ever really intention per se. So, I, look, no, I don't think part of what part of the part of why I want to use the context of things like the emancipation and enlightenment and anti-Semitism and the birth of, of Jewish political Zionism. It's precisely to name that political realities are taking an idea that works in theory in beautiful harmony with one another and forces us to make choices. That's what we're, that's what we're stuck with as a result of the 20th century. Which is to say, I don't think that being and becoming or horizontal and vertical are by necessity um, hierarchically situated. They are also not necessarily in tension with one another. Right? But the political circumstances of the past century have forced us to make, essentially, resource choices. They have also forced us to make, um, oftentimes, um, practically driven and sometimes emotionally driven choices of which are you more? Are you more loyal to your own people or are you more loyal to, to God? Right? That's what our rent is basically saying. Pe loyalty to your own people or loyal to God. And I use her version of God not to mean God, God, but God, lowercase God, which is the things that we're passionate about Jewishly. It's not a, it doesn't have to be a purely theological lead. It also can be, a it can be a moral aspiration of what the people are supposed to be. I don't think on paper, in theory, we can't be people who are both committed to Jewish survival, to the legitimacy of the story of the Jewish people, um, and at the same time be challenging ourselves constantly to elevate and transcend beyond our particular political loyalties to get back to the question of what Judaism is supposed to be for, right? Which is to, which is to say, you hear this sometimes, right? Survive, is survival legitimate for survival's own sake? Um, so Emil Fackenheim in March 1967, it couldn't be more perfect. March 1967, Fackenheim gets up and gives a talk in which he says, I confess I used to be highly skeptical of, um, of Jewish ideologies that talked about survival for their own sake. Right? That's a becoming response to a being. Right? Survival for its own sake, that, is that morally legitimate? And he said, I recognize in these unbelievable times, March 1967, they're digging mass graves in Tel Aviv. Right? He knows that he's, it's 20 years since the Shoah. He says, in these remarkable times, I have come to understand the legitimacy of survival for its own sake, and I trust that generations who come after us will respect that we came to this conclusion. That's a March 1967 realization, that actually it's not just that being is um, uh, instrumental for becoming, right, which it is, if you can't, you can't strive for anything if you're dead, uh, in, I guess certain theologies you can. Um, you, but you, it's not just that it's instrumental, but we have, to, we have to fortify it. We have to take it seriously. We have to say that peoplehood and survival are actually moral discourses. They're not instrumental discourses to the moral. They're moral discourses in and of themselves. And amazingly, 50 years after Fackenheim, just 50 years, it didn't happen what Fackenheim wanted, that, pa that later generations would look back at that and say, yes, survival was okay for its own sake. The American Jewish response 50 years on is largely, no, survival is not okay for its own sake. And, and the extent that the American Jews use a critique of what Israel is, 
or what Israel isn't, as a means of negating the legitimacy of being that Israel is, is a rejection of that notion that being is its own fortified moral discourse. So I agree with you, of course these can actually coexist together. It was easier in the 17th century for them to coexist together because of ex external circumstances, because I can't escape, right, either the being or the becoming. And what we're forced to is the, to try to do this delicate negotiation, this navigation of sustaining these two discourses within the context of Jewish peoplehood that, that oftentimes are going to push up against each other based on the political <coughs> circumstances that we find ourselves in. Yeah. Um, I was uh, fine with you through your analysis, and then where you seem to be getting prescriptive very much at the end, you suggesting some way the transporting or the importing of this kind of aspirational Judaism of becoming to Israel would necessarily produce the, the reestablishment of the shtetl. Um, you know, it's disturbing to me as, as a reform rabbi um, to, to hear words like that because it suggests somehow that, that the interplay of these two different, these Jewish worlds with different emphases one more focused on being and one more focused on becoming, that they couldn't actually create a more kind of mutual um, you know, influence on one another. And you know, I look at my conservative colleagues, reform colleagues, who are actively engaged in trying to create not a transplantation of American reform Judaism uh, here in Israel, but to actually uh, spur the development of an indigenous, um, progressive Jewish expression here in Israel is looking nothing like shtetls, nothing like it at all. And maybe therein lies the possibility of our salvation. So I would say that the analysis I agree is quite to the point, but when it moves to prescription, there really is the possibility of a much greater cross fertilization. Oh, I 100% agree. And I wasn't being prescriptive by saying that that was inevitably going to happen. I was saying that that's a possibility of what could happen which is that we, that instead of the project, right, instead of the project that you're describing, which is the building of a Judaism of becoming in a society that desperately needs it, but, but doing so for the purpose of the advancement of the whole society, I think there, are, there is a risk and a possibility that that doesn't happen, that the, that the Judaism of becoming becomes, um, becomes um, subordinate to uh, a language of survival rather than aspirational for the society. I'll give you a different example. Forget about reform movement, forget about Haredim. So there was a, a social scientist who did a study here in Israel who charted the ways in which um, there has been a huge Jewish renewal movement among um, secular Israelis such that the whole, the whole story of religious and secular, which was true 15, 20 years ago, is not really true anymore. Right? The dominant position is not religious or secular, it's somehow in the middle, Misorati, right? Something traditional with, you know, with Jewish values, and our institute is a part of that story as well as others. But there is a direct line between the rise of the attachment to Jewish values by Israelis and the decline to a commitment to democratic principles. Which is to say, when people study Judaism, it becomes Yiddishkeit, it doesn't become the instrument for societal improvement along democratic principles. That's an interesting educational problem, right? Because what happens is Judaism becomes classified as the stuff that is kind of like holidays and extracurricular activities and all that other stuff. And by definition, post-enlightenment, Jewish traditions and democratic traditions are thought of as in tension with each other because the hard work is to actually demonstrate the ways in which Jewish tradition makes us more committed to democratic values and human rights and religious pluralism. You have to do a lot of hard work to get to that place. And as a result, the credibility gap starts to emerge where people say, now that I'm more committed to Jewish values, I'm less committed to the values that the state was founded upon as democratic principles. I'm suggesting that the, the gap between the be being and becoming in this place happens through a reinterrogation of what it means when we actually teach Judaism in this country. And whether that happens in the context of particular denominations, whether it happens indigenously, or whether it happens through the instruments of the state, and my bias is to say that it's actually through the instruments of the state, that this happens in the public school system and in the IDF and in the public square and the public culture, the Judaism of becoming that is going to be 
um, that's going to make this place get back to the middle of the intersection between being and becoming is going to be one that, 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 that pushes against the notion of survival for its own sake and actually balances it out. And that's where I see the challenge um, within the context of Israeli society. Yes? You know, and I, I, the reason I'm quoting Fackenheim on the legitimacy of survival for survival's sake is because I think as a mid 20th century move, he is identifying that this is an urgent moral statement that needs to be said. Jewish people have the right to survive for survival's sake. Um, what I, um, I guess my, my pushback to your comment is twofold. Number one, again, this goes back to the B'nai Brak test. And I would say, really? Like, I, I think, I, I, I understand the argument of I like my kids better than other people's kids, right? I, I understand that. I understand the metaphor that says, as I love my family more than I love other people's family, because that's natural, that's human, um, and, and in, in many ways that's actually, that's morally legitimate, with the exception of a few fringe moral thinkers who say that that's immoral. Most consensus moral philosophers would say loving your family, you're allowed to love your family more than you're allowed to love other people's families. But then what has to happen next in order to turn that into an ideology of Jewishness is that you have to make a huge metaphorical leap. <coughs> and you have to say it's not just my actual family, it's my imagined family, which is something that we call the Jewish people. Now we have done that for a long time, right? That notion that the Jewish people are essentially an extended family. We have tremendous amount of text to this effect. The whole notion of when you convert, you re-enter into the, into the population of the Israelites as they were actually standing at Sinai. We do that precisely to signal that contrary so the Christian idea, which is that you get grafted on as a branch of the tree. Out now, that's Paul, letter to the Romans. Our, the rabbinic response to that was, no, no, you don't get grafted on as a branch to the tree. You get reintroduced at the roots. And I understand why we do that. I appreciate the sincerity and the obligations that it creates for us towards converts. I appreciate what it challenges us to do, which is to make this huge imaginary leap to say, you're a stranger, but you're Jewish, but I feel obligated towards you. But the very fact that the tradition is actually making us do that is because it runs counter to a different moral intuition, which says that people who are strangers who happen to also be Jewish, they don't feel like the people to whom I'm really supposed to be obligated. And there are a lot of fellow travelers that we have in Jewish life in this room where I could say, I don't like your life choices. I don't think you're doing Judaism right. <laughs> but I somehow am supposed to challenge myself to be in relationship with you. What I would want a Judaism of being to be is that which challenges us to do the hard work of transcending difference rather than being like a privileged moral position that all of us take for granted. What I also struggle with is that I think the, the central tensions that live in the world of Judaism of being is between people who feel that and people who don't feel that. <coughs> And the minute that I have to start convincing you that you're a member of my family, I've lost the argument. <laughs> and so what happens now in, a, in generations of Jewish life of people who are saying, what is this, this metaphor of family where you seem to want me to think that I'm a member of your family so you can tell me all the things that I'm doing wrong? Because it entitles you to a certain obligation, like in, in ter certain rights towards me. And I don't know what rights I get in return, and I don't know what res responsibilities I'm supposed to have. So it's okay to imagine this as being a central thread in Jewish tradition. I still think it's a hard thread in Jewish tradition, one that we have to wrap our head around. Sometimes it's made easy by anti-Semitism, sometimes it's made harder by the absence of anti-Semitism. And figure out how do you do the hard work 
of marshalling the case for a Judaism of being rather than taking the starting point of I identify with this already and therefore I hope other people will do as well. Um, others, yeah. Are you, uh, can you locate this in a, lo in a larger context? I, I'm, I'm wondering what, what the, is there, I wonder what the impact of, of the same tension between becoming a being and, and, and the global. Because I'm hearing over, so, uh, I think of American culture, what's happened, what happened in the recent election between America first and make America great. I mean, it sounds, it sounds like the same kind of tension. Aspiration versus survival. Great. Um, <laughs> what, uh, what's that? I don't know. Uh, I, um, I am very, I'm, a, I'm a believer to echo Isaiah Berlin, right? Jews are just like everybody else, but more so, um, right? Um, so I'm, will, I'm totally willing to say this could totally be understood through reference to global trends, American trends. I just then check out because I don't study that. So I don't know how to, and I don't, know, I don't know how to understand what's going on for us um, in reference to categories of what's happening to the world and, with, and without specific reference to our own particular experience. I would say it's probably true that this is a story happening to peoples and ethnic groups throughout the 20th and 21st century. And I also, part of my resistance is, we have argued for a long time that we are a people but a unique people. <laughs> Right? We've made that case for a long time, that we're holding on to this thread of being a people and this thread of being a religion, and most ethnic groups don't do that, and most religious groups don't do that. So in some ways, I'm willing to say, yes, let's, let's study this again in six months, but in, without using any of these texts, instead using just you know, what's going on in America and what's going on in the world. And part of me also wants to say, how do we interrogate this as a specific Jewish problem? And I, I know I'm not giving you an answer to that question. I'm just that's what I would struggle with in, in figuring out the right way to respond to it. Um, any others? Yes. How how would you how would you defend or how make a case for a for a Judaism of being? How you know the idea of the of an extended family that the world, the idea of I think we need to do it for the survival of the Jewish people. So the question is, how do you how do you actually make the case for Judaism of being? Um, so I would say two things, just evidenced by the source sheet. One is a historically based argument, which tends to not really work for people, right? Of this is the conditions by which Jewish people who had rose, this version of Jewish people who had rose and became dominant and important in the 20th century, and is still very powerful Israeli for Israelis and is still very powerful for a certain subset of American Jewish elites, right? American Jewish elites, are, are many of them are still Jew Jews primarily of being, right? Their Judaism is essentially about support for and relationship to the state of Israel and support of the state of Israel as it currently is. So one argument is a purely historical argument. The problem with that argument is that you invite someone to say, but those are not the historical conditions we're living with anymore. <laughs> so that might have worked for last century, but it doesn't work for this century. Part of the reason I wanted to juxtapose it to the classical text at the beginning, and there are many others. You know, I think um, I saw Noam Tzion before. Noam could come up with a very long list of the ways in which we have classically understood Judaism as family prior to or independent from the idea that Judaism is about mission. There's a lot of texts in our tradition to make that argument. I think part of the, part of the move here is to understand this as an ancient core Right? in tension with the Judaism of becoming, and to watch the ways in which they are being pulled apart in response to political, particular political circumstances. If I can get somebody to say, even yeah. though I am not by definition, I'm not personally a Jew of being, I understand the legitimacy of that as being an authentic voice in how Jews have understood Jewish peoplehood, uh, dayenu. <laughs> That's a, it is a big move. I've seen it happen with Muslims. I've seen it happen with Christians of registering that this notion of Jewish peoplehood, of, of a, a national homeland for Jewish people, is not merely the product of a particular political set of circumstances in the middle of the 20th century, but actually something that the Jewish people have been thinking about for a long time. And, and I guess the other kind of educational technique around this is that we figure out ways to not, how do I get you to become a Jew of being? How do I get you to be a Jew who holds intention, the being and the becoming, that too is sufficient. 
Part of what happens to us as educators is when we identify people who have tilted to one side or the other, we, we think that we have to make a much more dramatic move to pull them back to the other side. But somehow positioning what the center of gravity actually is, what the, what the position of balance actually is, invites people back into attention as opposed to forcing them back to the other side of an issue. And this has huge ramifications for how we think about Israel and peoplehood education in America. Um, I have time for, am I done? Oh, one more. So I see um, the question is about 1917, which I'm locating kind of in the middle of the story. Um, uh, here is the, uh, here is the, um, the anchor of these two, um, two traditions uh, that, that come to a fore in terms of the articulation of, uh, in 1917 seems to be the, mo the great moment of transition to the Judaism of being as defining the political ideology for Jews in the 20th century. That's the big moment. And one of the things that we're seeing now is both we are beneficiaries of the product of that, the creation of the State of Israel is a product of the 1970, you don't, you don't have the State of Israel without the emergence of a Judaism of being. And we're also starting to see the unmaking, in some ways the unraveling, of the insistence that the Judaism of being produced by 1917 is gonna be the sufficient argument for sustaining what it means to be Jewish um, in the 20th century and beyond. Thank you everybody.